welcome, welcome back um, after coffee. Um, it's my pleasure to be the chair for our next session. Um, and just as by way of introduction, I'm Siobhan Stevenson and I'm interim director of the Northern Ireland Museums Council. Um, and I have to say what stimulating discussion we've had over the, the, this morning and yesterday, um, and particularly the discussions on um, from the national museums on the work and the great expertise that has gone into a lot of the, um, the work to do. And I have to say, from the point of view of the local museum sector, um, I'm so inspired um, and motivated by the discussion here. And really, there's uh, the gauntlet has been thrown down, really, to get a lot of the messages from today's conference out um, and to empower local museums as agents for change in this area. Um, so thank you very much for the speakers so far. Um, today's um, discussion is really moving a little bit beyond the confines of the museum and looking at our public spaces um, and how um, the, the issues of colonialism are reflected and how much are very embedded in um, the very structure of, of space and where we live. Um, so without too much further ado, I'm going to introduce Dominic Bryan, who hardly needs any introduction. Um, but Dominic is an anthropologist specialising in political anthropology um, and with wide-ranging interests in identity, symbolism and tradition. Um, I think his work will be well known to many of you in the audience. Um, and particularly looking at things like parades, human rights, um, all the really easy issues <laughs> today. Um, but Dominic is going to widen our perspective and look at the public spaces in which museums exist. And I'm really looking forward to his discussion on the ideas of empire and colonialism and how that is embedded in our everyday life. I'm um, particularly interested from last night in how football grounds are going to play a major, a major component in his discussion today. Um, so without further ado, I'm handing over for him to give his paper, Empire on the Streets. Symbolic references, contested spaces, and colonialism in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, how do I get this up on the screen? What should I be? Is there a button here? That's it. You're up. Oh, I'm up. sorry. Thank you. Well done. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Yes, I'm going to get to the football grounds in a in a in a moment. Um, uh, this this paper is going to explore public space within which the museums exist. I want to do that both sort of physically, but also the ideological constructions. Uh, that take place and take a broad look at the ideas of empire and colonialism. The BBC ran an article on this and suggested yesterday that because I'm going to look at streets that somehow um, I'd done a whole load of research on this. I can assure you that the examples I'm bringing up were not done by long hours, done on about 10 minutes of Wikipedia. And, and in a way, that's part of the point. Okay, you, you, when I get to it, that's part of the point. So and the rituals and symbols um, of ideas. And I want to make some preliminary suggestions about processes of change and transformation. So I'm interested in the idea, the idea of culture war. I'll come to that a little bit later. Who is threatened and why, I think, is another way of uh, putting that. And I suppose at the end of the day, people have heard me before will know this, I'm going to suggest identity, not about history. Um, so let me start uh, by asking the audience, all right, depending on uh, your, your upbringing and things, do anybody want to give me a go between those three places? Is? Right at the back, the cop, right, of course. Now, those of you who think, because those, those of you know I've gone into controversial things, um, and the idea that I might 
um, persuade Liverpool Football Ground to rename its stand, all right, because of course the COP is named after Spy on COP, the Boer War battle, okay, um, would, you know, I probably not that stupid, probably not, but it, and I looked up places uh, were named and Wikipedia hard done research has 26 grounds in England football and rugby league uh, although some of them have been more recently demolished the Parc de Prince in Paris has a stand called the cop um, uh, FC Strasbourg has a stand the Netherlands interestingly has two grounds um, which, which uses the spine cop um, uh, as a way there's a village called a hill uh, cottages in, um, a hill in South Australia, golf club in Scotland, uh, Clo, uh, lots of places are named COP or are part of a, a remembering of the um, in in 1900 um, in the Boer War. All right, about 300 people. Uh, died and about 1,500 were wounded. And I say, that's part of the issue. Is it? Are they? Does it even mean that anymore? And we were just talking there, and it's sort of, it's sort of for me, it's the Trafalgar um, naming sort of things. You know, that square in London was named after a battle. Who knows? Who cares anymore? It is Trafalgar Square now, it means the square in London. Embedded in so much of our life are these symbolic places, names, right the way through. When do they become contested? And when do they, in fact, lose their meaning altogether? And why? So that's what I want to try and get it get at. Anthropology Collins. Um, famously argued that there is no history without culture. Let me move these. Um, there is no history without... I've just said anthropologist famously argued. I don't think any anthropologist can just think they call themselves famous to be true. But So let's go back on that. And then Marshall Salins uh, argues there's no history without culture. In doing so, he was making an important about the embedded way historical narratives and our perceptions of the past work within society. Palmer recently argued for an anthropology of history. All right. In doing so, they wanted to recognize the different ways of relating to time. They were quite interested in looking at the ways that indigenous peoples understand time and their past and comparing it. I'm actually going a little further than that. I'm interested in seeing how history as an idea and a discipline, historiography, is so embedded in our own cultural identity that we can't actually find ways out of it. All right? And a sort of um, what they see historiography to be, I'm not going to go through them all or, or discuss them, but broadly, a way we see the world through history that impacts on our understanding and how the world works. And partly what I want to say here is, is there are other ways, even within Western society, of understanding the world. So understanding how group identity and boundaries work, all right, which are important for understanding all of this work, but is not a lens that is very often used in this sort of space. Historiography is based on a set of cultural relationships themselves determined by power, I'll be coming back to that, with a particular understanding of what history is and how it works. Whilst it sits within certain institutional frameworks such as museums and universities, it's also part of a complex web of discourses, rituals, symbols in everyday life that form part of our society. History is seen as a core discipline in school curriculums. It forms part of a wide variety of popular culture, books, films, and documentaries on most streaming platforms, commemorative days embedded in uh, marketing practices, uh, cocooned in ideas of play 
heritage and tradition, on coins, on official uh, and ever present in the narratives of, of the spaces of politics, particularly, and this is the key point, particularly nationalism. Okay? This way, the way we all think about ourselves is within this concept of nationalism. And that doesn't really happen without historical narrative. Uh, in its statues and flags, buildings, bridges, and to repeat, Salins, there is no history without culture. A contemporary web history has long been the core marker of ethno-nationalism, and this is the political nationalism of the modern world. So in that sense, whilst all of our museums and institutions are trapped within that, not, not only the ones that are, 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 are seen as the dominant colonial narratives, but all of us are trapped within, within that. Um, uh, wonderful and complex interwoven argument for the role of history and historian, and reflected that, and in quotes, a particular theory of history can influence our deeds by influencing our sense of agency and responsibility in shaping the world around us. She noted that notions of pro drove the spread of industrial capitalism, imperialism, nationalism, depended on the ability of uh, by recourse to assumptions about race, religion and culture, uh, dreams of utopic uh, ends again and again justified horrific means. It is interesting that the now now its outreach as public history, but if Sadler's arguments are right, the historical has always been here, although often disguised by those in power, influenced by it, uh, who seek to sustain institutions within high status. All right, so the, I, the, the historical ideas of progress and things, as she so, shows in her book, are interwoven in the power structures, power structure in this case of, of the British Empire. For my arguments here, history becomes an authorising discourse. As, as Van uh, Lewin argues, drawing from Berger and Luckman, legitimacy is always the legitimization of the practices of specific institutional orders. Hang on, I want to go back, I want to go back just to this, this picture here um, and mention it, just throw it in again, just randomly picked up, I was going, I was in the British Library. A British Museum, sorry, the Science Museum in London, and uh, there was lots of stuff there. This one particularly caught me. I'll just read it out and let you think about it. Vickers Vimy bombers over Egypt. I feel like I'll, it's going to sound like a general when I do this. I should, probably should. During the 1920s and 1930s, the RAF used aircraft extensively in the Middle East and on the northwest frontier of India for air policing. Bombing was considered extremely effective in this role and far cheaper than the use of troops. The wonder who they could have been. Uh, uh, the, the target, it's good heavens above, that's a surprise, and exaggerated the military value of the bomber. That sort of stuff is, our, our museums are riddled with it, okay? The discourse of history, an academic category constructed, constructing the past, has particular relationship with rituals of commemoration, narratives of our museums, and ultimately sustain the idea of the state. Right? It is important that we, uh, that we appreciate the Irish and British political contexts, which in these discourses that valorise nationalism um, and are reproduced through that. Satya, in her writing about the role of the discipline of history in making the British Empire, reminds us that national, uh, nations and empires exercised such per persuasive power because they were the object of a deeply influential mode of ethical thought, historiography. Um, so, in the context here, uh, we're looking at nationalism. It is built on a form of historicism rooted in the modern colonial period and it infiltrates so much of everyday life. It is interesting, 
it is in interesting ways very atheoretical. I can answer questions later on why I think history is still devoid of theory. Um, largely devoid of a model of social theory and allows an understanding and power dynamics. All right. You still find very few history textbooks, anything taught at school, which sits down and starts to teach people about how group identity works. And yet, those books, those history books, are absolutely fundamental to the formation of group identity. As many social theorists have pointed out, the everyday comes part of a naturalised way of being, or a habitus, as Bourdieu might, su a Bourdieu might su su suggest. Bourdieu argued that, the, argued that these things are often a doxa, remaining unchallenged until a heterodoxy is produced. Forms of resistance against power, which will then be followed by defensive development of an orthodoxy. This is where culture wars come in. All right. So you've got these things that exist in everyday space. They're there. They're part of a hegemonic way of seeing the world. All right. You then get resistance to that. And interestingly, this is where, where the culture war is. Those in power then need to resist it. So they produce an orthodoxy. So ironically, the heterodoxy, the resistance, comes before the orthodoxy. And what a culture war is, I think, is that orthodoxy. It's those with power and trying to say, we're under attack. And that's very, very powerful because people feel, because they can be made to feel that our everyday, the ordinariness, the things that are part of us are now being attacked. All right, and that's why these be these things become so um, so deeply emotional. All right, um, despite the fact that there's not been a culture war, it's just that power has meant that certain things have become so embedded um, within our society. And here's a, here's an example for you. Um, I, I, I remember trying to quietly persuade my mum that the that the golly wog on the side of a Robins, Robertson's jam should be taken off. And understandably, you know, I don't not for a moment suggesting my mum was particularly racist in any way. I know she isn't, but of course racism is so embedded in our society that at one level, as you know, we are all racist. It's 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 so embedded in the way we think and do things. But if you start trying to go at those things, people will look at you and think you're sort of mad for wanting to get rid of it. Now, luckily, some of these things have been achieved, but when you're sitting down trying to persuade your own mother of them... Um, so here's another little area that I decided to have a look at. Again, it was done very quickly by going through the A to Z. Again, in the BBC team to suggest that I've been doing some research. You don't need to do a lot of research on it. You go through the A to Z and come up with how many of the street names of Belfast um, are, 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 have ideas of col colon colonial ideas, ideas of empire, battles, royalty, monarchy, all meshed in um, uh, to our everyday, uh, everyday life. The, 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 the main bridges of Belfast are the Queen's Bridge, the Albert Bridge, King's Bridge and Queen Elizabeth II Bridge. Um, uh, and interestingly, and this is how change is taking place, our last few bridges have been called Lagan Railway Bridge, Lagan Bridge, Dargan Bridge, and Lagan Footbridge. So, so the naming thing has shifted. As um, if you look at Dublin, you can see that process a hundred years ago of that sort of naming and, and renaming uh, uh, taking taking place. But again, of course, people don't notice this. It's in the everyday, and if at some point, and I'm not. I'm not suggesting that we should do a massive renaming. I do sincerely believe this is part of Belfast history, so I'm not trying to suggest that we should do a massive renaming, although on the odd occasion we should look at um, maybe Prince Andrew Street and a few things and wonder <laughs> whether in this case, and anybody who tries to say, oh, we'd never change that, we'd never move that memorial, I'd always say, you don't know that. There's things can change. There's no memorial out there that is actually sacred, although they're all supposed to be um, sacred. And let me just let me just quickly flick through my last example. Don't know where this is going to go. This is a banner that you often get in, in orange parades. 
Uh, there's two or three of them in the Belfast parade. I, I don't know about Glasgow, but I suspect, the, I suspect this. And this comes from a, a, a work of art in the um, National Gallery in London, um, Secret of England's Greatness. All right, and I don't need to, you can see the, the issues in the, in the picture, Queen Victoria handing a, um, a Bible. It's very interesting, really, handing a Bible down to, I don't know if it's an African prince or an Indian prince. I've seen it read in a couple of ways. In, in the actual picture, Prince Albert, Lord uh, John Russell and Lord Palmerston are, are, looking, are looking on to this scene. And I just wondered to myself, again, I'm not, I'm not standing up here trying to say that this banner shouldn't be paraded through the streets. Maybe you might feel differently. I do wonder, as we go on, whether they would get a new banner with that image on it now. So it's just an interesting thing. I'm not about banning it, but I wonder whether, in today's context, the Orange Order or that lodge would, would, um, would, would, would get that new banner. So let me, let me just make some conclusions, all right? Um, I, I, wanted, I wanted to just build this, this wider context, um, everyday context, and the role that a historical understanding of the world has in that every day. The expectations it raises when people come into places uh, like museums. Um, whilst in some respects universities and museums are a place apart, they are, of course, um, part of a set of power relationships that impact and are impacted by changing social and political relationships. Because museums are often depicted as being part of a culture war, I think it is important to understand the broad context and why they are likely to be area of contestation. So here are my final points to, to sort of bring this all together. The, the deeply embedded nature of our understanding of the relationship between the past, present and future that structures around a particular form of historiography that in turn structures much popular presentation of who we are. This is about identity. That's what the contest tends to be about. Right? The historic, historiography has played a central role in legitimizing forms of group belonging, and particularly nationalist ideologies and the colonial relationship that remain central to the museums uh, as institutions and more generally. Central to understanding this must be theories of groups. So my argument is you've got to have a theory of group relationships, of group identity. You've got to start by understanding how that group identity stuff works before you can really do the history, would be my, would be my suggestion. It's particularly important when you start to look at policy solutions and, and the danger is that you can overemphasize the historical aspects of it. Some people will know that I've argued this before, that when it comes to commemoration, I can't quite understand as an anthropologist why historians sometimes are asked along at all, all right? Because it's not about history, it's about identity, all right? That's what people are doing in commemorations. They're experiencing their identity. I'm gonna throw this out there. Most often, I'm not sure the history is relevant at all. I know that's quite controversial, but anyway. Um, I'm also interested in where remembering and forgetting why at some moments things become contested and other times uh, they are not. I'm not sure that the notion of remembering and forgetting does the job we need to, but again, it's about how group identity evolves over time. And indeed, addressing the role in commemorative practice and rituals and symbols as a, a, a form of social construction and conflict transformation, the conflict that we're bound to have in our society. So lastly, I'm just putting up here a recent report that was done, I was partially involved with, although not a writer on, on, on ways of dealing with this. So, so there's quite a lot of work done in anthropology and sociology and political science of how to manage contested spaces Coming out of America, it won't surprise you at the moment with all the stuff that's going on. So I've just thrown that up. I can, I can email anybody who wants to, um, who wants to get a hold of it. Um, I, as I say, it's not written by me, but I do think it's got lots of different interesting practices of engagement in it around contested spaces. And that's me done. Thank you.